Today I'm joined by the one and only Niccolo Soldo. Uh, he is the author of the very well-known and very, very good substack, Fisted by Foucault, uh, which is, yeah, as spicy as it sounds. Uh, and he is uh, one of the most veteran posters on the so-called dissident right, a man who has been here since the forums, since since things um, were even spicier than, than we know them. Um, welcome, Niccolo. Hello, Alex. Thanks for having me. I'm really glad to have you on. Uh, obviously, this has been a very long time coming. Um, you are such a you know important figure in, in the wider space, uh, and I'm glad you're on. Um, I will not interrogate you about AIDS and homosexuality because this has been covered by other podcasts. I will, though, uh, point people to your other appearances and obviously to the famous thread, which I will I think it's archived somewhere. I will post it in the show notes. If people are interested in the history of AIDS and kind of what happened there. It's quite, you know, it's revealing, I would say. Um, it's been very revealing to me in the sense that it's probably one of the few pieces of content that I've consumed from the internet has, has given me multiple nightmares and has haunted me since. So I will make, I'll make a short mention on that. The AIDS thread that I put together, I started over a decade ago. The old thread, the forum version, is floating around. It's in PDF. You can find it in a million places. And I'm sure you can share that with your listeners. I also did a more cleaned up version on my Substack, a seven-part version, uh, where it was less, let's say, polemical, less spicy, to use your word. It was interesting. I was in New York uh, between Christmas and New Year's recently. And I was at the Sovereign House. And I was getting introduced to a whole bunch of people I didn't know. And I swear to God, roughly two thirds of them, like you're the AIDS thread guy. I'm like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> and so that's my legacy. And, and it's gonna be with me for the rest of my life. And there's no changing that. And I've spoken about it at length. I appreciate you not wanting to talk about it, but it is a horribly interesting subject. And it's not just people on this side of the political aisle or in these corners of the internet who have gotten value out of it. Put it this way, I've met random Americans here in Croatia on vacation, white, black, whatever. And when I tell them who I am, they're like, oh my God, I sent my mother the thread. That's insane. So it did have some reverberations beyond our little corner. Of course. I mean, there's there's the, the, the incredible, you know, um, revelation at the center of this is how AIDS was interpreted as being this kind of all-purpose disease that, you know, I, I grew up fearing AIDS, you know, it was like, that, that was scarier than Jesus, to be honest, the idea that you could, you know, something bad's going to come for you. And it wasn't our Lord. It was, it was this virus and you're going to die and you're going to have like Kaposi sarcoma just covering your body. And, you know, it's going to be they, agony. They did, they did a brilliant strategic move by making it appear that everybody was at risk when not everybody was at risk. And I'll say one last thing before we move on to the real stuff. The big shift was that in the 1970s, gay liberation was centered around the right to be who I am, the right to live the lifestyle that I choose. And then when AIDS came and toppled a lot of that, it no longer became, this is the lifestyle choice that I choose to live, rather we were born this way. And the biggest lesson from all of this is that gay men in particular, they're not like the rest of the people. You know, women provide that civilizational check on male behavior. You remove that check, guys are going to be guys. Exactly. Yes, yeah, so without the without the longhouse, the world turns into the goon cave. And uh, I think, unfortunately, you know, the Castro district is one such example. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, like I said, this is, a, a vast uh, topic, and you've covered it more than uh, more than enough. And people will find a lot of valuable insight. I think to a lot of uh, different things: history, sexuality, uh, gender differences, all of it. Um, and I will link to it. But another topic that I wanted to cover with you is another homegrown concept of yours: uh, the the concept of Turbo America, which is an interesting one. And I think it's it's something that you have a lot of insight in not being in America. I think it's interesting for people who are uh, outside of the central uh, domains of the empire to look inward 
and assess, okay, what is the strength of the empire? Because uh, as well, me as well, I, I, a lot of people say, okay, you know, Eastern Europe, you know, based, you know, there's going to be a, a resurgence of, of right-wing thinking here. And, you know, they bring in Russia to, to prove this. And um, I don't think so. So maybe you can expound a little bit on what is Turbo America? Why, you know, why is America influential? Why is it still influential? Uh, and what's the trajectory there? The, there's there's a lot of misconceptions about what I mean by Turbo America. Unfortunately, my concept of Turbo America is that the United States is now in a phase where it is actively pursuing the expansion of its global hegemony beyond uh, certain rational capabilities. Point in fact being that they've put together Russia and China making it more difficult for them to do so. And it's also teamed up with the fact that the United States has taken an ideological turn lately, what we call wokeness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. For well over a decade, back in the old internet forum days, I had debates with certain friends, Bronze Age Pervert, one of the most prominent ones, was whether people in elite ruling circles believe this nonsense or they're just parroting it for the sake of being allowed into those circles and pursuing raw power in a cynical fashion. And my opinion, you know, being a Balkanot is that I tend towards the cynical. And having conversations with people who are in those circles over time led me to conclude, and this is the position of a lot of people that I've spoken with as well, is that at first it was a very cynical position, but over time, these people became true believers. So the United States, which had a very pragmatic, let's say, approach to international relations, now has more of an ideological flavor to it. And this is best exemplified by the fact that they try to force down the throats of their client states, not all of them, they are exceptions, of course, but of most of their client states, their social mores, which are constantly shifting and turning. The, the focus on gay rights, transgender, feminism, scorecards used by the U.S. State Department, uh, NGOs now who are not NGOs like Freedom House, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all this micromanagement. So the Americans are now in a situation where they're in a little bit of a desperate state because the Chinese uh, are growing their power, they're growing their influence, economic, political, and so on. And the Americans are trying to put out these fires, these blazes that are popping up all over the place in order to retain their hegemonic position. But at the same time, they're shooting themselves in the foot because they insist that these other cultures conform to their own constantly evolving social mores that make no sense locally. So the concept of Turbo America is the Americans doing this. It doesn't mean that America is going to win. And people tend to think that I'm some sort of American flag waver. Uh, the United States is going to win all this. No, 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 no. I'm saying that they're in desperation mode. They're doing everything possible in order to maintain and or expand their global hegemonic uh, position in the world. And when you mention the fact that I'm outside of it, I grew up in southern Ontario, right near the border with the United States, with western New York. And... Us people who grew up in those places in Canada near the border, we tend to have a pretty good grasp on the United States because we're not of it, but we were right next to it. And it's always easier, I, in my opinion at least, and I, and I think this is true, uh, to be able to understand from the outside looking in rather from the inside looking out. And people say, well, why are you always focused on America? You have to focus on America because it's the world's most dominant power. It's the metropole of our empire. All of us living in Europe, we're all its, we're all its subjects. The, United, the, the European Union is now a protectorate. Unfortunately, you and I are speaking English. In a, in a proper world, you and I would be speaking German right now, Alex, because you're a German speaker and Croatians are all German speakers, right? Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I think you're you're right, obviously, that this is, you know, a hegemonic power. And I feel like people are underestimating that this power is not necessarily waning, at, at least in, from the perspective of cultural power. It is expanding at a, a breakneck speed. 
Um, the fact that, you know, you've got Bollywood and whatever Chinese movie production or influence they have in Hollywood, that is a very small fragment of, of what's going on culturally, globally. Um, you know, j just looking at, at how um, local culture shifted, especially here in Romania, I mean, this is, you know, it is 99% Amer even even local politics is shifting towards an American bent. And even, even the division between parties is seen very much uh, as a Republican versus Democrat, even though that doesn't map at all uh, onto onto local politics. So it's it's warping people's minds in a way that is not only like historically unprecedented, but people are not grasping how much this is water. This is this is the the, the element that we're swimming in, and it's. Um, it's really interesting to witness, especially given all the high hopes that uh, the American right has for whatever resurgence of, of traditional. Yeah, and there's a few examples here. The first point, the first example is the best example: BLM in Budapest. Yeah, and Romania too. It makes zero sense. There's no black people there. Number two, France. France has traditionally been culturally very significant. It's punched well above its weight on the world stage even in its post-colonial phase. And two years ago, there was a big piece that came out of the New York Times, and it wasn't just the only one. They were lamenting the Americanization of French academia, uh, the idea of everything's got to be viewed through the, uh, the lens of race or the lens of sexuality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Even though many of these concepts were developed in France with the post-structuralists, with people like Foucault and all of that, it still did not conform to uh, the French constitution, which is technically colorblind. So this creeping Americanization is happening across the world. And people who criticize my comments, which is separate from Turbo America, that America has never been more powerful than it is now, they'll point to the 1990s and they'll say, hey, the USSR fell apart. China was not as strong then as it is now. And so the Americans were had, had actually no competition. They do have a point, but only up to a point. Everyone now has a smartphone in their pocket. Everyone has all these applications, and it's all from the United States, almost entirely, TikTok being the, the, major, uh, the major exception. But it's this soft power, it's this technological power that's come to colonize. You look at the UK, Alex, 20 years ago, the UK was still somewhat hermetically sealed culturally for the United States. There was some crossover. But now it's become very Americanized. And even they are doing all of the, the cultural and political things that the Americans are doing, you know, the, 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 the racialism and all of this. They, they've effectively been politically and culturally colonized. The French, they're trying to fight back. Germany, Germany's thoroughly Americanized, except for the East, of course. And then you point to the countries where we are out in the ex-communist bloc. 20 years ago here, not many, a fair amount of people spoke English. German was the second language here because of how many gastrobites we have up in Germany. Half my family's up there. Now everybody speaks English. And the kids here, they either speak with a British accent or with an American accent, depending on the media they consume. Because it's all YouTube, it's all uh, Instagram, it's all, it's all streaming, it's all Twitch, it's everything. And I think that this is grossly underestimated, the amount of soft power the Americans have. And we can't forget either that even though we see the Americans fumbling around a bit this last 15, 20 years militarily, there's still a huge power militarily as well. So to underestimate Uncle Sam, I think, does a disservice to all of us. A lot of that is hopium and copium, Alex. Yes, I, I, I agree. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's been interesting to communicate this because like as, as people who live at the center of empire, they see... Um, you know, decaying regions, they see, um, you know, bumbling, demented presidents being voted in, they see, you know, election integrity being questioned. I mean, this looks like a crumbling empire, but you always have to compare it to what we you know, what other people have in their arsenal. And it really is not comparable in any way. I mean, China is obviously a, a superpower. It's one that, you know, it's incomparable to how it was 20 years ago, but still, even China is waning and it hasn't reached its peak at the level of the US and it will, I don't think, ever reach it because their capacity to produce culture, to disseminate it, to make it high status, especially, is very, very low. It's very, yeah, it's very low. No one's interested really in Chinese culture. The only 
Asian culture that has any currency out West is Japanese, all the weeaboos. Or K-pop, right. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And K-pop too, yes. I'm, I'm a little bit too old. I don't understand that phenomenon, but it's there. But when you're talking about uh, Americans seeing their country falling apart, you drive to the United States and a lot of it is really crappy. Poor infrastructure. There was that bridge that collapsed in, in Pennsylvania. There's a lot of those things that happen. The thing is, Americans have been so overwhelmingly successful historically that, and, and, and the way that the country set up constitutionally, philosophically, everything, all Americans think that they have a stake in their country. The problem is that it's an empire now. It's no longer a country. And so when a guy says to me, you can't be right about American power because look at the shitty state of bridges in, in Ohio, I say, why does Ohio matter? Ohio doesn't matter. You matter to the ruling elites as much as Diego in Chile or, or Franz in, in Bremen, Germany. That's how they look at you. And it's most of the United States does not matter. What matters are the key centers of power. The Bosniwash Corridor, Chicago, LA, Silicon Valley, Dallas, and Miami. And the rest does not matter at all. So because some parts are falling behind, some parts are are being depopulated, some parts are being immiserated, does not mean that the United States itself is falling apart. Yes. Um, I, I wonder what you make of, um, I have this in my notes here, because this is some kind of a, an expression that's that's haunting me a little bit. And this is Anatoly Carlin's contribution to the discourse. It's um, the idea of wokeness. Because you mentioned before that, you know, America is not necessarily going to win. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of uh, fragilities within this empire but at the moment, it's it's quite powerful. Um, but wokeness, as the the animating spirit of the zeitgeist, of, of as the thing that we're all kind of reacting uh, to, um, he he calls it uh, the tribute that meritocracy pays to human dignity, um, and he sees it as a sort of generalized replacement for noblesse oblige, uh, and that you know elite human capital, as he calls it, you know, the people who actually are the movers and shakers, the the people who are you know innovating there in Silicon Valley, they're pretty much everywhere. This is their creed because this is kind of a moral replacement for any sort of more a conventional morality. Um, and because this is the case, he doesn't really see it going anywhere because in his observation, most people who are these movers and shakers, be it politically or technically, um, you know, they need this to uh, legitimate morally uh, why they're on top and other people are at the bottom. Okay, well, in, in a large part, he's correct. It's basically a replacement for Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, everyone realizes that you have to have something philosophically to rally around, and it has to be something that gets a lot of buy-in from people, and that will, give, that will buttress the regime. Christianity has been attacked forever, and it's really lost a lot of its potency in, in much of the West, some places much more than other places. The centrist ideas of individual liberty and voluntarianism and all of that never took real roots because that only services a small portion of the elites and you can't get others to buy in because they're simply outcompeted uh, from birth or throughout life. And so there is a little bit of a noblesse oblige here, but at the same time, the elite capital thing, it's, I don't buy into that as much because these people and oftentimes are functionaries, Alex, and they need direction. You can have 140, 150 IQ. It doesn't mean you're smarter than a 110 IQ person who has charisma, charm, et cetera, it will leads. You know, these, um, Anna, Anatoly, he's a nerd, uh, like Banania, they're nerds. And these are people that you have to smack around and put in a room and let them do the work that they're the best at. But these are not people you're supposed to rely on to lead a country because everything would go to hell pretty quickly. But he does have a point with respect to the noblesse oblige and there's buy-in from people because it buttresses their position to lead that country, that state, whatever. At the same time, there's also a utilitarian aspect to this because if you can export these ideas as a new creed, you're stamping your authority on these other places and which we see constantly happening. The, the constant insistence on Poland to accept gay marriage, for example. If you could do all of this, then you're homogenizing your entire empire. 
So it's not just noblesse oblige. There's also a, a cynical usage of it, even though these people might be true believers in, them, in it themselves. Yes, yes, I think that's that's the case. Um, I mean, what what do you think? You mentioned Poland. What what has the Ukraine war taught you about Turbo America? I mean, how do you see that playing out in in the last few years? What's what specifically, Alex? I mean, specifically, you know, the, it's it's been um, a strange. Um, a bit of a circus, you know, it started very much in force. It's very dragged out. Uh, a lot of people, including Anatoly Carlin, have had, um, you know, predictions of Blitzkrieg. It hasn't happened. Um, you know, how do you see the U.S.'s actions? You know, well, essentially, it's, been- this, this war wrong footed a lot of people. A lot of us did not believe that the Russians would move in. And they did. That was the first surprise. Yeah, me, Second surprise me neither. was that they violated Powell's doctrine of overwhelming force. They went in with a light touch. Second surprise. Third surprise is that the Russian economy didn't fall apart, the ruble didn't collapse. So it's been a constant set of surprises. What hasn't surprised is two things. One is I wrote at the beginning of the war and I updated it actually just last week, the winners and losers. Big winner, United States, small winner, Russia, small loser, EU, big loser, Ukraine. That, in my opinion, and I think it's correct, still stands today. Now, growing up where I did, Alex, in Southern Ontario, we had a huge community of post-World War II expats from Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, Croatians, Slovenians, Hungarians, Slovaks, Poles, and West Ukes, and Lithuanians as well. And all of us were really close. Our communities were all very close to one another because we were pretty much the Catholic anti-communist belt. The Poles were a bit apart because they were on the winning side eventually in that war, but we we're all still together. The Ukrainians, all Byzantine Catholics, we call them Greek Catholics, Katolitsi, these are very, very anti-Russian people. And they are pretty much the exact same people that my, me and my people are, culturally everything. And when they started this push away from Russia, these are valid historical grievances. These are grievances that can only be undone with time. I don't crap on Finns. I don't crap on Balts. I don't crap on Poles. I don't crap on Romanians when it comes to Russians because Russia has been very heavy handed. It's been brutal. But at the same time, I told the Ukrainians, I said to them this, guys, listen, the Americans are going to fuck you. They're going to fuck you. They're going to use you and then they're going to drop you. And now after the failed counteroffensive this past summer, which was the neocons maximalist shot in order not just to defeat the Russians in the battlegrounds, but also to destabilize Russia and hope that somebody would take power, that's fallen apart. So now the more, I'm not gonna say the realist, but the more realistic policy planners in the United States, whether they be in the State Department or whether they be in the Department of Defense or the CIA are like, okay, you know what? We have to cut our losses here because we gotta move the show to China now. We gotta work on them. We wanna park this war with the Europeans have them pay for it, have them supply it, have them manage it. And Ukraine, sorry, you're going to lose more territory than you began with. And this was so easy to see. And that's the tragedy. That's why like, there's a lot of people who constantly crap on Ukrainians. I can't do that. I understand what they're going through. Uh, we had a similar situation, us versus the Serbs, even though you can't compare the Serbs to Russians. Russians are serious, serious people and are very powerful people. But this was so easy to see from the beginning. And that's exactly what's happening because the, the recent history of the United States is to use their allies and then just cast them adrift. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's um, that was what I noticed at the beginning of the war, um, that people really weren't granting any sort of historical context to why this started. I didn't expect them to do it, but I also could understand, uh, you know, essentially, you know, NATO encroachment and all this type of stuff that, that was happening. Uh, you know, the Maidan revolution, a lot of things had happened up to this point, things that people were either not aware of, uh, aware of, or they didn't want to be aware of that, you know, made the conflict a little bit more understandable. Uh, in a way. Alex, you know who got this conflict? You know who understood it right away? Obama. Mm. Obama, he did an interview with Jeffrey Goldberg, that piece of shit from the Atlantic. And he says, because at the time, they were saying that the Dems were soft on Russia. And that was Romney's big thing. And he said two points. First point is that Ukraine is an existential matter for Russia, while it's not for us Americans. 
And number two, because of that, Russia has escalation dominance. So if you were to do anything with Ukraine with respect to violence, at some point the Russians were going to win because their entire existence uh, required that. And you, you try to make this point clear to Westerners who are pro-Ukraine or, or anti-Russia, and they'll descend into circles of whataboutism and this and that. The point is very simple. If the Chinese set up a client regime in Mexico and try to incorporate that into a military alliance, the Americans are going to go in there and start ki uh, kicking the crap out of everybody down there, and they would have a right to do so. You know, not all states are created equal. Not all countries are equal. We all live in different neighborhoods. It's unfortunate, but that's a fact of life. It, it, you can't treat Belize the same as you would treat, uh, let's say, Japan. Yes. I think you could also see this in the, uh, you know, famous now uh, Tucker Carlson Putin interview. Um, you know, you had two clashing perspectives on empire. Um, you know, Tucker obviously expected something else and Putin went down whatever historical rabbit holes there. Um, but, you know, the his interpretation of what Russia is and the fact that he draws on, you know, thousands of years of imperial history is at least a clue that, you know, he's his perspective on on geopolitics is informed mostly by that, mostly what uh, on his expectations of what, you know, his um, the, the multipolar world, according to Russia, should be. So um, I wonder what you made of of that interview. I mean, uh, was it world out hard. Putin slobbed out hard. And that's to be expected. You know it yourself, Alex. You talk to anybody east of Vienna, and they're going to give you a history lesson every time you talk about their country. It's very simple. This is who fucked us. This is what we should have done. This is where we won. Screw them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. To understand anything geopolitical, you have to understand the historical context. And there is a, there's been a trend in further Western countries to eschew historical context because it's retrograde, because it's not progressive, and it has nothing to do with today. But you cannot understand these conflicts without understanding the historical context. It's such an elementary thing. Our first president here in Croatia, Franjo Tuđman, he was a historian, by the way, and uh, so he would get to these long digressions as well. And the West characterized him as a 19th century leader living in the 20th century because he was focused on historical arguments uh, for the creation of the state and all of this and all that. That's just part of the course here. You cannot, because we constantly live in a history. Uh, this part of the world has swallowed so much history. You're constantly reminded of it that you cannot separate yourself from it. The United States was set up to walk away from that stuff, whether it be those historical grievances or uh, his or aristocracies and all of those things, it was supposed to be pretty much a year zero. We move on. We're progressive liberals. That's not the case here. Yeah, not at all. Even though yeah. some pretend to be. Yeah, I think I, and one of my other questions for you is, you know, you you uh, mentioned this, you know, the, the concept of fighting for a better past. Uh, and, yes. you know, why why is it that the Balkans are just like a, a, a cauldron of horror, historical horrors? I mean, I know the you know, slaving out hard type, perspective on this it does sometimes feel to me a bit tinged with we was kangs and you know we kicked the turks butt and you know i mean yes if you tally up all the times you did kick the turks butt and then add it up to all the times you were the kicky of the turks <laughs> um, it's it doesn't even out quite that that much but there's a lot of weight on that history um, obviously, the geographical position, I think, is not necessarily favorable for a lot of these countries. But what what is it? Is it a spiritual, a geographical? There, there, there's a few things here, Alex. Yeah. First of all is that the Ottoman era retarded this part of the world. We did not have the societal, civilizational, philosophical, I don't want to use the word progression, but you have to use it in the neutral sense. And so concepts like Ethnicity and nation were almost entirely absent from this part of the world because of the millet system. People were organized along religious lines, Christian, Jew, Muslim, and of course, non-believer who gets killed. And at the same time, the Ottomans, they were at their peak in Europe during the 15th, 16th, and early part of the 17th century. After that, they began a very slow decline that pretty much started to speed up afterwards. And these were not innovators of technology, innovators of business, et cetera. 
the typical Turkish beg lord, he would have a lot of land and he would have tenant farmers there, mostly Christian for that sake. And he would tax them at a higher rate. He would tax the local Muslims. And Muslims who were not begs, they would largely work within the towns and cities as craftsmen. The bulk of the traders, the marketers in the Ottoman Empire came out of either the Armenian, Greek, Jewish, or even Serbian communities. The Muslims didn't want to have anything to do with that. So they lacked a civilizational progress that retarded the entire region. And when they fell apart, it was these locals that had to pick up the pieces. The problem was that there was no real elites in these countries that could erect these, let's say, modern states uh, that were already existing in the West, in the Central, and in, in Northern Europe. Uh, and at the same time, you also have the problem of borders, Alex. For example, France and Germany, they resolved their border in World War II, Alsace-Lorraine. Germany and Denmark, they resolved their border with the Holstein-Schleswig, uh, what was the name of the question? Back in the 19th century, I forget. The Pyrenees have long been a border between Spain and France. And uh, despite a little bit of a border conflict between France and Italy during World War II, that border was largely resolved a long time ago. In the Balkans, you don't know who's what, where, why, et cetera. Good fences make good neighbors. And if you have a good fence, then you have a certain level of comforts and security where you're able to focus on your internal issues. If you're constantly worried about borders, there's no stability there. Uh, to, you know, if you look at it from an economic perspective, if a company doesn't know what it's doing, you don't want to invest in that company. If exactly. they're trying to figure out their existence. So a lot of what happens and a lot of what you see online is people fighting for a better past, the famous phrase from this part of the world, in that they want to justify the existence of their people, the existence of their states, uh, and, they, and they want to justify any let's say, greater or even maximalist aims of their people and their state, because this has not been completely sorted out like it has in the rest of Europe. Yes, and it's it's quite uh, interesting how confusing it can get, especially, I mean, I'm in Transylvania. This is a very uh, heterogeneous space. There are communities from all over the world, like you described, you know, your, your upbringing in, in Ontario. This is pretty much what you have. You have a lot of... Um, it's not even the aspera or enclaves of people who have lived here for hundreds of years, like half a millennium people. My, my ancestors as well, my German ancestors have been here for many hundreds of years. Um, and, you know, whatever um, nationalistic impulse comes up here is always, it always feels a, li a little bit wrongheaded because, um, you know, we've been living side by side for, for hundreds of, of years. Uh, and it's not... It it's it it strikes me as quite incoherent, which I don't necessarily think is the case in more of the you know Balkans proper, because this is kind of the edge of 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 the, right. of the Balkans. Um, there you have a bit more um, maybe motivated territorial aggression and things like that. Um, yeah, but this, here it just really never made any sense to me. Like you know proper nationalism, Romania, especially because Romania is also kind of a patchwork country. The south of Romania with the north and west of Romania, you know. The same population speak kind of the same language, but you know, you know, Christianity. And I mean, we're Catholic. There's a lot of uh, Protestants in this area. South is all almost all uh, Christian Orthodox. Um, you know, there's it's it's quite heterogeneous in itself. Uh, and then also what, what you mentioned, I thought was really interesting and might be interesting to the listeners as well as the, you know, the idea of missing elites. We had this when the Romanian Revolution happened. Um, what was interesting here was that. They brought in a Habsburg elite, um, Habsburg king, knowing that there was literally no one who could do the job here and that they needed the Western stability to, um, you know, to essentially import um, right. colonialism. And, and, yeah. And, and that was a pattern throughout the Balkans. Uh, Romania, just like Serbia and then Serbia's Yugoslavia, the first one, they looked to France and they pursued a, a program of centralization of the bureaucracy in the States. And that's what worked for them. And that reflects in Bucharest's, for example, architecture. They call it the Paris of the Balkans. And it's very correct to do so because there's so many beautiful buildings in that city that remind everyone of Paris. But you look at a place like Greece. Greece had no local elite whatsoever when they threw the Turks out. That was a German project. And that was a project of, run by Germans who were classicists. 
they came down there. They thought they were going to encounter the descendants of, uh, of Plato, of Socrates, of, uh, of Aristotle. And it was mostly Albanian-speaking peasant farmers, shepherds and stuff like that, right? So they had to create a nation out of, out of nothing. Where I'm from, I'm from West Herzegovina on the border with Dalmatia, an hour here from Splits. When the Turks were kicked out of Bosnia in 1878, the local Muslim elite was the landowning elite that remained. The Serbs had their traders. And we Croatians, we had our Franciscan priests. And that was it. So there was this lack of elites that could in any way, shape, or form be compared to those in Vienna, in, in, in Paris, in London, uh, uh, in, uh, in Berlin, and elsewhere. And so you had to create something out of nothing. And it didn't necessarily reflect the culture. You had to drag the culture by its nose into the modern era. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, you know, an interesting twist here as well is that the, the few elites that we did have here were Jewish merchants, which were um, essentially the city that I live in was almost entirely, and, and the, the nice parts, the ones that are now tourist destinations, are almost entirely built by Jewish are you Are you in Satumare? <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm not in Satumare. I'm not going to dox, but a lot of these, a lot of the cities here are very similar right. across across uh, Transylvania. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, it was interesting. That was kind of a fledgling elite. Um, people did not like it. And By the then, way, you know what they, you know what they pejoratively call um, us people from the mountains here in Split? Because Split was always a center of culture. It was like a mixed uh, Latin, Italic, and Croatian place. They call us Vlox. Oh, really? Like Volachia. How come? Well, because we're Chobani. We're shepherds, basically, right? Oh, yeah. So we're like the hillbillies. <laughs> and uh, when, I was in, um, when I was in Bucharest, this is a little bit of a side, but when I was in Bucharest for the first time, this is about seven, eight years ago, I was there for business. I happened to walk by the big, big palace. And there was a huge demonstration that day. All these shepherds from all over Romania came and they're all dressed in the traditional the huge woolly coats and the big staffs and everything. And I'm like, oh my God, this, this is bringing back genetic memory. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're also called Chaban in Romania as well. Like, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's a very, a very Balkan, and especially with South Romania, like the Southern Romania is more, I would say, um, you know, tied in, in a brotherhood with the Balkans than, than the West of it, which is- well, it's, Yeah, there, there's more of a difference between Timisoara and Bucharest than there is between uh, Timisoara and Budapest or Bratislava. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, I mean, you know, that's what we like to, to think as well. And then the thing is, you could almost physically see the demarcation between where the um, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire ended and where um, especially kind of Ottoman rule was more prevalent. And then obviously it lasted long across the country, but the Austro-Hungarians managed in like what 150 years to build institutions, um, you know, support buildings, administration, things that were just, you know, almost um, space age technology for the local, you know, Choban and and uh, um, you know similar. So uh, and the fact that they brought in um, populations like you know the family that my dad came from, the Germans, you know, they had all sorts of positions here in administration, defense, um, and they were littered all across Transylvania. Um, and you can even tell, like, if you're driving through a German-Romanian uh, village, you know, built in, like, the 16, 1700s, it looks German. <laughs> it's yeah, almost- it's, it's, it's the same story in the XU, in the northern parts, in Slovenia, and especially in today's northern Serbia, towards Hungary, and in eastern Croatia, you had the Donauschwaben. And those were all the German farmer colonists that they brought in. And those were always the best looking and most wealthy agricultural properties around. And they remained that until the Germans got kicked out after World War II. Yes, exactly. I mean, my, my family was from, from Donauschwaben, but here in close to Timisoara and Reshit. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, there's, yeah, a, a huge amount of history and, um, you know, it's an endless conversation if we want to go down that path. But there is more that we should be talking about. And I want to ask you about your uh, apocalyptic slapdown with uh, Artem Berezovsky, the uh, the son of um, Boris Berezovsky. I mean, why does his father deserve the amount of infamy that you, you heap upon him? And why was it the best day of your life, uh, you know, that, that fateful day 
that he stopped breathing. Uh, it was, this was done, I, I, I made a couple of comments in reference to Boris Berezovsky because the Tucker interview was going to come out. And there was people already pulling crap about how many journalists Putin killed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of those names that are chalked up to it are journalists that were killed by Putin's opponents, but they, you know, they, they, they rely on people being ignorant. And so they just put that all in there. And the first book club I did over at my Substack was a book called The Godfather of the, Cle of the Kremlin by Paul Klebnikov. Paul Klebnikov was a Russian American journalist for Forbes. And he covered Russia during the Wild West and shortly in the first years of the Putin era. He was a descendant of a white Russian nobility. And he wrote that book. On the cover of the book was Boris Berezovsky, looking like an evil Danny DeVito, character out of central casting. Boris, the entire book wasn't about him, but he played a central role. And for a very good reason, I'll explain. Boris Berezovsky was one of the seven original oligarchs, Russian oligarchs, six of whom were Jewish. We have to concede the points. And these were men who scammed, stole, shot, and blew, their, uh, blew up their way into power in 1990s under Boris Yeltsin to the point where they got very close to him. They were considered part of the family, family in air quotes, because it was like an extended family. And these are people who were positioning themselves to rule in a post-Yeltsin era. Boris Berezovsky, he got a PhD in applied mathematics. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man. That's very, very tough, applied mathematics. He got his start out at a place called Avtobaz, a company he set up where they would import foreign automobiles or buy the ones from the communist elite and they would sell them. This was in the first days of the post-communist era. Problem was that he would sell a lot of cars he didn't have and he would just rip people up. And so he started building this empire based around Avtobaz and he linked up with the Chechen mafia in Moscow who were one of the big three mafias there. There was the Chechens, there was the Armenians, and then there was the Slavic ones, the, the Sol Solnenstable. I, I think I'm pronouncing it incorrectly. And these guys were very vicious. And they began taking out opponents who were jockeying for position, trying to grab all of these companies that fell apart uh, under communism, and now they had no one to own them, no one to run them. And so Boris Berezovsky, he was part of that original gang of seven, and they did a lot of horrible things. For example, they rigged the entire privatization scam scheme in Russia when they were privatizing all of the ex-Soviet Union's best companies, whether it be uh, oil and gas companies, whether it be nickel, whether it even be Aeroflot, the, uh, the national airliner. For example, Boris Berezovsky rigged the Aeroflot's uh, privatization auction so much that he ended up, only, he, not only did he set up the auction and run the auction, he ended up with the entire Aeroflot fleet for 13 million US dollars, okay? They had a scheme called uh, vouchers. What they did early on is they said, hey, we're going to teach Russians about capitalism. We're going to give every Russian citizen vouchers in these companies that we're going to privatize, and they can do with it what they want. Russians had no idea what, they, what these things were about. And at the same time, their economy was collapsing. They were having food shortages. People were desperate. And these guys would come around and say, hey, we'll take your vouchers off of you. They're just pieces of paper. And they say, okay, here's the paper. Give me money for it. And they ended up grabbing all of this stuff. And so they effectively owned the entire economy by the late 1990s. Not only that, but Boris Berezovsky in particular, he was not just very arrogant, but he had no scruples whatsoever. He was dealing not just with the Chechen mafia, but he was also dealing with Chechen she uh, separatists in Chechnya who were fighting against the Russian government. Meanwhile, he's working with them. He's providing them arms. He's even helping some of the terrorists who came later, Shamil Basayev and uh, Ibn Khattab from Saudi Arabia. And Berezovsky was too clever for himself because around 1997, Yeltsin was looking really ill. And he said, you know what? I think I've got the guy who's going to replace him. He's going to be my puppet, a guy named Vladimir Putin. Putin played dumb for those first two, three years. And when he became president, 
he turned the tables on Berezovsky and the oligarchs. And he said, okay. And he did a famous meeting. It was live on TV. He sat down the seven with him, big table, typical Russian style. He said, gentlemen, you've stole a lot. You've made an incredible amount of money. Here's the deal I'm offering you. If you stay out of politics, you can keep the money and you can keep these businesses. You got to run them in accordance with Russian law. If you delve into politics, I'm taking all of this away and I'm putting you in prison. Of those seven, four took the deal right away. That was uh, Friedman, who runs Alpha Group, and that was involved in one of the supposed Trump-Russia things in 2016. Um, he's also big into oil and gas, especially oil. Vladimir Potanin, who is the, uh, the, the non-Jew, he's the one that runs Nor Norsk Nickel, the world's biggest heavy polluter. Uh, two others whose names I can't remember off the top of my head right now. There was three who didn't take the deal. Vladimir Wosinski, who was a media baron, he went right away to Spain and he's been living in Spain. I don't know if he's alive still, but you haven't heard a peep out of him. He just wanted nothing to do with it. He took his money and ran. Mikhail Podorkovsky, who was the big oil guy, he decided to take on Putin in 2003, 2004, and he ended up in prison. He, and I'll get to him in a second, Boris Berezovsky decided to go head on with Putin right away because he considered it a personal insult that his protege turned the tables on him. Well, that didn't last long. Berezovsky had to flee and he chose to flee to the greater London area. He was either in Kent or Sussex. I think he was in Kent, but I'm not sure. The problem with Berezovsky was that he was so toxic. The Americans didn't want anything to do with him except for Neil Bush, the, the Bush family bagman, George Dub, uh, George uh, W's brother. And so he was working with MI6. There's a very good documentary that I constantly share with people on my Substack and, and on Twitter and elsewhere. It was a UK production around 2003, 4, 5, 2005, let's say, uh, that took a look at the daily life of Boris Berezovsky and how he was plotting and scheming to overthrow the Russian governments. And he was very open about it. He wasn't, in, he wasn't denying any of this. And they're showing him going to meetings, talking to Neil Bush, how are they going to do this, this, and this? He was so toxic that even though he was one of the main financiers of the Orange Revolution in Ukraine in 2004, 2005, they still would not permit him to come relocate to Kiev. His plan was to use Kiev as a staging base for regime change in Moscow. And that's how toxic he was. Now, he made a cardinal error shortly after that. He decided to sue his old business partner, Roman Abramovich, ex-owner of Chelsea, for the rights to uh, Sibneft, which was one of the big, 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 big oil companies based out of Siberia that was privatized during the privatization era. And he decided to sue him in a London court. And he got rocked in that lawsuit. The judge took a huge crap at him and said, you're delusional, you're a liar, you don't even know you're lying, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that wiped Berezovsky out to the point that it practically bankrupted him. And as it's reported, he hanged himself in the shower shortly thereafter. He even sent a letter to Vladimir Putin requesting that he be allowed to return to Russia, and Putin replied, no. So this was a man who helped immiserate Russia in the 1990s for the sake of agglomerating power, concentrating power in his own hands. Uh, you cannot think of or write a better villain than him. And he was very open about it. He was, there was no appeals to, there was no, let's say, realistic appeals to democracy. He would mouth those words, but as you were saying, you could see the bile coming out of his mouth. He wanted to rule Russia. He wanted to own his economy and own it politically. He did not take Putin's deal and he paid for it. Um, unlike Khodorkovsky, Khodorkovsky was slightly more polished than Berezovsky, but Khodorkovsky, what he had in his pocket was alliances to big financial interests in the United States and the UK based on his company, Yukos, uh, another huge oil giant. And this sounds conspiratorial, Alex, but it's not because it's reported in the Financial Times. About a week before he got arrested on the tarmac somewhere in Russia when he's coming off his private jets, uh, the Financial Times reported that he transferred all of his ownership in Yukos to the Rothschilds. 
And it's at that point that the entire Western jihad, media jihad of Putin began. Because Khodorkovsky, Khodorkovsky was their guy. Berezovsky was too toxic. No one wanted anything to do with him. Even the Brits said, hallelujah. Mm. So his son found me. I guess he was searching the name or whatever. I don't know. And um, I said, you know, the day your father hanged himself was the greatest day of my life. It wasn't the greatest day of my life, but in a way it was because it shows that state power, when responsible, can take on these types and force them to do what they did. Yeah, and it's it's an interesting archetype that you reveal here because this is obviously what happened in Romania as well. I mean, this uh, you know we didn't we didn't have the the scale of, of of Russian theft because we did not have the scale of Russia, but voucher theft, uh, you know, the privatization scams to this day, the people you know, the the local oligarchs at the scale that they are, literally almost all of them made their money this way. Um, and it's really funny, even in, when you see them in interviews, they're like, you know, they, there, are, there are no billionaires in Romania that have not profited illegally off the private, uh, privatization scams. And there are, I think, I don't know, 50 or 60 billionaires in Romania. So. Yeah, well, what frustrates us most, though, is that these are all people who are part of the communist elites prior. Exactly. So all of a sudden, they become either liberal Democrats or fake nationalists, or they become free market capitalists. That's that was a problem with the shift from communism to liberal democracy. You know, it was all oath based. You know, it's like, oh, you know, we believe in in liberal democracy now. You know, because uh, the fall of communism was peaceful, or at least it was peaceful, at least on the side of of the liberals. Um, you would have had to hang these people. In, There's in, a yeah, exactly. There's a Montenegrin rocker who's got the great name Rambo Amadeus, and he's a very funny guy. And he had a great line thirty years ago. He called it. He said, like shit flowing through pipes to communists flow through democracy. Yeah, well, that's, you know, the, the demon in democracy is all about this. You know, um, Ligovsky, uh, Ligutko essentially saw the, the uh, shit flowing through the pipes in a very direct fashion because he was one of the dissidents. He fought hard to, to get to rid his country of, uh, of communism. And then he saw, you know, the turds popping up <laughs> the next day and he was like, wait a minute. And he saw how well and how well oiled these people were to adapt to, uh, you know, liberal democracy and uh, adapt uh, to um, internalize all its creeds and become true believers, as we discussed pre previously. So I had, I had a conversation with a with a guy, an acquaintance who's from Costanta. It's interesting because he's of Ottomanian stock, by the way. Yeah, yeah, that's a ancient lore. And they resettled a lot of them there. The Tsinsari, the big traders, and he mentioned to me how the Securitate in Romania, they effortlessly segued into it. There was one faction that was adamant about staying the way they were, but most of them said, oh no, fuck you. We're gonna grab all this stuff. And they did, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a depressing reality. I mean, the, the fact that um, people in this region, I don't know if, you know, it's, it's a spiritual question, it's genetics, whatever it is, they're very, adaptable. They're very pliable, especially morally, and including the church in many ways. If anyone knows about the, you know, the, the church, especially the Orthodox Church in Romania during communism, very pliable, very morally. Here's, 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 here's an aside. First of all, you're right. We're very, um, what's the word I'm looking, we can improvise all day long, and that's one of our big skill sets. You can throw us anywhere and we'll somehow survive. But on, on the question of the Romanian church, I was shocked a long time ago to learn that it's the only Orthodox church where you can get married three times. And in my early consulting days back out in, in Canada, the consulting firm I was with, it was, a, it was a smaller firm, the EA to the owner operator, beautiful Romanian woman, one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen in my life. And she lives in Malaga, Spain these days. But I go, Evelyn, Evelina, is it true that you guys can get married in, in your church three times? She said, third time's a charm. Yeah, I mean, there's there's also the flexibilities uh, that have grown into the church with time, and you know, that's that's why I think it's so funny to me because I have all sorts of you know guests on here, people already discovering Christianity. A lot of them convert to Romanian uh, Orthodoxism because it seems like you know it's it's a solid faith, 
and I can, you know, I, I cannot but smile <laughs> when people say that because I'm like, it, it is exotic. Okay, at least I understand, uh, you know, everything exotic seems more interesting. And it, it is more, you know, if you if you want a lot of ritual, if you want things that are old and heavy and, and you know, a lot of nice sturdy dogma that you don't have in a place like, you know, Church of England, all sorts of weird uh, reformed religions nowadays. I see why, but at the same time, the reality on the ground, the the lived experience of Romanian Orthodoxy, not always as uh, as profound and uh, and full of um, grace. As- no, no, no. But what, what one thing that did surprise me, though, I thought it'd be much, much more secular than it was. Uh, not to say that it isn't, but when I was in Bucharest and I was there four or five times over the span of two years, I would see people pop in all day into church light a candle, give something to the priest, and that's it, and say a quick prayer. And so that I was taken aback by that. I thought it was much more secularized than it is. But for people out in Western Europe or, or especially North America, it's not, you know, it's not 1300s Byzantium, as some, as some wish it would be. Yes, I mean, people are just grasping for something solid, and I can definitely understand that. I mean, I am myself as well, and who knows what you know, misconceptions I have about my ideologies. But we are coming up on time here. I want to ask you the last question. This is the question of the show, the question everyone gets uh, about a subversive thinker that you recommend to the listeners. Could be any sort of thinker, writer, a- anything you, you can come up with. Alex, I have an answer for you. It's going to be an answer that's going to piss off any Serb listeners that you have. And I understand why it would. But I think he's a very, he was a very subversive thinker. He was a, a genocidal maniac in World War II who killed a lot of innocent people, whether they be, uh, especially Serb peasants. He also killed a lot of communists as well. His name was Max Luburic, Vyakoslav's first real name. He was a general in the Axis forces in Croatia, in the Croatian puppet regime. Uh, he was of the Stalinist mindset where no man, no problem. Just kill the person. Now, that in itself is not subversive. The subversiveness that he should be known for, because he's a very little-known figure, is he broke with the fascist exiles in Argentina in the late 1950s. He was in Spain, by the way. He ran to Franco Spain, and he lived in Valencia. And he was the first post-war European to propose what is now known as Nazbalism, the union of the far right and the far left to pursue national interests, uh, to basically toss aside any ideological disputes in the name of a greater or a larger goal. And this upset a lot of people because the hardcore remnants of the Ustasha regime were mostly located in Argentina, and Toronto at the time. They said, "How can you do this? This is you're, you're being you're being you're being treasonous. You are basically spitting on us." And he said, "No, we made a lot of errors, to use his word, uh, a lot of crimes, war crimes, and so our cachet is spent. We have an overarching goal of setting up an independent country, but because of the legacy of the bad things that we did." And he never shied away from it. He even wrote uh, pieces to his followers saying, I can't be a part of anything in the future because I'm so tainted by everything bad that I've done. Not that he was apologizing for doing those bad things, but saying that you, you, no one will ever you know, believe me or this and that. Um, it was subversive because the fight during World War II was between the fascists and the communists for a large part. And so this synthesis was intended to create the basis for national uh, reconciliation, is what they called it, to create an independent state. And he was assassinated in 1969 by his godson, who was working for Udba, the Yugoslav State Agency. He was bludgeoned to death in his own little place. He was poisoned first and then bludgeoned to death. And I went to go visit the house in Valencia a few years ago. And his assassin is still alive, lives in Sarajevo. Ilya Stanich, his godson, an alcoholic. He's probably like around 80 years old now. And what makes it interesting is that when the events leading up to the breakup of Yugoslavia and the events leading up to the war and the beginning of the war began, 
it turned out that his methodology of bringing together the nationalists and some of the fascists, even though they were mostly dead by that point, with the ruling communists is exactly what happened. And it worked. And so that is a historical example of a subversive thinker who not only put words down on paper and who had publications, but who saw his vision succeed well beyond his death, which was an assassination. So we had these ex-communists come over to our side, work with the nationalists, all in unity for the sake of national reconciliation. So I think that's a good example of what you're looking for, Alex. Yes, definitely. And definitely one that's not been mentioned uh, before. And I do apologize to the Serbian listeners if they've been rattled by this. But uh, yeah, yeah, Ford, I, they have every reason to hate his guts, everything. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't blame them at all. And they should. And he's, he's in hell right now. I'll say that. But if you look at it objectively, his vision won out. The fascists, the, re the fascist remnants, those fossils, they came back in 1991, a few of them. No one wanted anything to do with them because their time was in the past. Uh, they had no cachet. And his vision clearly won out and it succeeded. And if anyone wants to delve deeper into um, facets of uh, Central European, Western European, and I guess American as well, subversion, and uh, especially from a well-informed historical context, uh, please do read Fisted by Foucault, one of um, one of the best substacks out there. Um, thank you. So thank you so much. Is there any other thing outside the substack that will be linked in the show notes um, that people should be checking out? Yeah, check out my Twitter, my X handle. It's at Fisted Foucault. Uh, and it's just that in substack. I really don't have a presence anywhere else. I really should be trying now to raise my profile, Alex. Uh, and, and I'm thinking about how to do that without not necessarily compromising myself, but spreading myself too thin. Uh, but please do check that out. And please do check out my Substack. There's a lot there. I've written about 400 entries over these past three and a half years. Yeah. And there's something for everyone there. That's extremely prolific and just beautifully detailed, uh, documented. And yeah, very much recommended. So thank you so much, Nicolo. This has been a pleasure. Um, I'm, I'm really glad we could do this. Great. I enjoyed myself too. We finally did it, Alex. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.